St. Mark's Gospel is the shortest of the four. And the ending is brief and dramatic in content. In this first talk, we're going to examine at some length the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want to begin by contemplating a little bit the title, Son of Man. Jesus uses the title, Son of Man, to describe himself throughout the gospel. And it's worth taking a moment to get a feel for where this term comes from and how it would have been understood by those who were listening to him. In the book of the prophet Daniel, the term son of man is used in a few places. And it's actually kind of ambiguous. For instance, in Daniel uh, chapter 8, verse 16 uh, and 17, the term son of man is addressed by an angel directly to Daniel. That is just using the term son of man to say Daniel, you, human being. So the specific passage is uh, verse 17. He said to me, understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end, as Daniel was granted one of his prophetic visions. Elsewhere in the book of Daniel, however, Son of Man is explicitly a messianic title, and the way in which it is used is uh, well worth listening to for just a moment. So in Daniel chapter 7, uh, verse 13, we have the following passage. This is one of Daniel's prophetic visions. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. Well, now that sounds really familiar, doesn't it? And Mark is quite deliberately evoking that when he quotes Jesus in a similar fashion twice. In Mark chapter 13, towards the end of his discussion of the end of the world, Jesus mentions, they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And later... In his uh, testimony to the Sanhedrin, he again um, says, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with clouds of heaven. Let's dig into these references a little bit more. So looking back at the book of Daniel, the greater context is of imagining the messianic age when all of the uh, pagan nations have been destroyed. So in verses 11 and 12, there's reference to um, a beast that was slain and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. And that beast is symbolic of the pagan nations that were oppressing the people of God. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away. Again, the other pagan nations also were no longer ruling. But their lives were prolonged for a season at a time. God allowed them to persist for a while before the coming of the Messiah. Next, we've got the uh, Son of Man coming on the cloud of heaven. And to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So it's very interesting to see that the prophecy of the Messiah in the book of Daniel is very much a prophecy of a Messiah who's going to have an everlasting reign. We're not speaking really of an earthly kingdom at this point. All earthly kingdoms ultimately end. For a kingdom to be never ending implies an eternity about it. In other words, precisely what Jesus had been preaching about with regard to the kingdom of God throughout. So when he testifies in front of the Sanhedrin and is directly asked, are you the Messiah? He replies, I am, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. They understand that he is quoting himself as fulfilling the prophecy from the book of Daniel in that context. There's another subtlety there to what Jesus says in Mark 14, 62. 
when he says, I am, that is a subtle claim to his divinity right there. In um, the Exodus, when Moses asks, you know, of God, who are you? And he, re he replies, I am who I am. God is being in and of himself. And Jesus claims that same title in Mark 14, 62, as he claims his Messiahship in the presence of the Sanhedrin. So, Son of Man is overall an ambiguous messianic title. It can be used just to designate a human being, but it also has this messianic meaning as we see in the book of Daniel. Jesus deliberately uses an ambiguous term throughout as part of his overall sense of secrecy about his mission that we saw throughout the Gospel of Mark. But when it comes down to it at the moment of the Passion, at the trial, he makes clear that the Son of Man title is indeed messianic when applied to him. Let's review a bit the overall progress of the Passion narrative in the Gospel of Mark. Starting in chapter 13, um, in verse 8, he uh, mentions that many bad things are going to happen. Nation will rise against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the sufferings. Jesus here is pointing out for Peter, Andrew, James, and John listening to him that his own sufferings are going to anticipate those that they themselves are going to have to undergo after, in the time to come after his death and resurrection. In chapter 13, um, first in verse 2, and later on in verse 14, Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Just to review the significance of the temple, the temple was originally built in the reign of King Solomon. Its purpose was to be a permanent home for the Ten Commandments, the two tablets that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai. Because those tablets were inscribed by the fingers of God, the tablets were uh, understood by the Jewish people as being a relic of the presence of God. The temple then was a special location of the presence of God on earth. And its time was coming to an end. In fact, the temple that they were beholding was actually the third temple to be built. Why? Because the first two had been destroyed in invasions, actually. But in predicting the destruction of a third temple, Mark makes reference to, when you see the desolating sacrilege set up where it ought not to be, let the reader understand. Well, that's cryptic. But what he's alluding to here is that, actually going back to the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel records prophecies of the desecration of the temple. Prophecies that match closely the historical behavior of the Greek king Antiochus IV. So forces from that king appeared, profaned the temple and the fortress, and ended the sacrifices in the temple. And they set up an abomination. That is, they set up an altar to the Greek god Zeus in the Jewish temple, thus desecrating it. In context here, Jesus is anticipating the final destruction of the third temple, which later happened in 70 AD by the Romans. And we'll talk about that more later. But for now, I just want to emphasize his prophecies of the destruction of the temple so we can see how they get referenced in an indirect way after his crucifixion. Chapter 14 begins the Passion in earnest. In verses 1 to 2, uh, Jesus' various enemies decide that the time has come to kill him. 
part of their motivation is the humiliation Jesus imposed upon them in both his cleansing of the temple as well as in his addresses in Jerusalem. The parable of the vineyard comes to mind as well. In verses 3 to 9, Jesus is anointed by the woman. And this, in effect, represents a fourth prediction of his death. It also seems to represent the final disillusionment of Judas. Let's consider the figure of Judas for just a moment. We recall that earlier in the gospel, Judas was among the twelve. He was among the twelve who was commissioned to preach repentance for sins, to cast out demons, and to heal the sick. Nothing whatsoever in what Mark records suggests that Judas lacked any of the power that the other apostles had. So Judas had actually been going out and working miracles and preaching repentance. But he was very focused on an earthly fulfillment of the kingdom of God. And Jesus predicting his burial and anointment was then for him the final straw. He was ready at this point to betray Jesus because he was no longer convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. And uh, they promised to give him money. In the end, he was willing to be something of a mercenary about it as well. Perhaps another way of interpreting it would be to say that Judas figured this whole thing was going nowhere and going down in flames, so he might as well make some money off of it. As we see in a moment, that kind of mindset reflects someone for whom it would be better to have never been born. That's quite a phrase, that it would be better to have never been born. It hints strongly at what perhaps constitutes Judas's eternal destiny. Jesus celebrates the Passover meal with his disciples. Let's recall for a moment what's involved with the Passover feast and what it commemorates. The Passover feast was instituted as part of dealing with the tenth plague against Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. That was the plague of the firstborn that was inflicted upon the Egyptians, where all the firstborn children of the Egyptians were to die. The Jewish children, in order to be exempted from this, they were, their, their families were charged with slaughtering a Passover lamb and painting a sign with blood on the door jamb. That Passover sacrifice was a renewal of the Abrahamic covenant. It was a way for the Jewish people to join their sacrifice of the lamb with the sacrifice that Abraham made to initiate his covenant with the Jewish people. So the sacrifice renewed that covenant, and they celebrate it annually thereafter. Immediately following this, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them and said, Take. This is my body. Interestingly, the four verbs used here, that he took the bread, that he blessed the bread, broke the bread, and gave it, are the same four verbs used for describing his action with the multiplication of the loaves in each of the two multiplication of the loaf miracles that we see in the Gospel of Mark. Those multiplications of the loaves anticipate the miraculous multiplication of the body of Christ under the appearance of bread in the Eucharist. His words here are unequivocal. Take, this is my body. And he took a chalice, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Remember, they had just celebrated the Passover feast in which the blood of the lamb was poured out in respect of the Abrahamic covenant. Jesus here is making clear 
that his upcoming death is the ultimate Passover sacrifice. And just as at the Passover, those who sacrifice the lamb partake of the lamb and eat of the lamb, by instituting the Eucharist, Jesus makes it possible for all to partake of the body of the Lamb of God in renewal of the new covenant that he came to establish. So this is followed by uh, Gethsemane. And in a literary sense, Gethsemane parallels the transfiguration, albeit not in a terribly pleasant way. Again, he takes Peter, James, and John with him, alone, as he goes to pray. But instead of beholding light, they behold darkness. Instead of remaining awake with him, they fall asleep. For the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, as he puts it. So Gethsemane is a moment of tremendous desolation. One interesting detail here is that he addresses Peter as Simon. Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? In a sense, it's a moment in which Peter feels himself as far from Jesus as ever. After this comes his uh, betrayal, his arrest, and his trial. As we just discussed at this trial, Jesus claims divinity, I am, and messiahship coming on the clouds. There's an interesting detail here with regard to the high priest. So the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? Jesus answers, I am, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his clothes and said, why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What does he mean by blasphemy? Jesus saying, I am, claiming to be God in that moment. That is the blasphemy to which he refers. Except, of course, it wasn't really blasphemy because it was true. But another detail here regards the tearing of clothes. So the tearing of clothes was a way of expressing shock and outrage. But there's an interesting clause in Leviticus chapter 21, verse 10, with regard to this. The priest who is chief among his brethren, upon whose head is the anointing oil is poured, and who has been consecrated to wear the garments, shall not let the hair of his head hang loose, nor tear his clothes. So, ironically, after all of this steadfast proclaiming of adherence to the law, the high priest violates the Levitical law in tearing his clothes at the moment that he condemns Jesus. This is a way of conveying his complete lack of spiritual sincerity in this pivotal moment. Next we come to Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate um, seems weirdly indifferent to the whole affair. He was more than willing to let Jesus go. That's not what happens. And Jesus is condemned to be crucified. As the soldiers mock Jesus, starting in chapter 15, verse 16, everything they say is true, even though they don't seem to realize it. Hail, King of the Jews! Well, he was the king, and they should, in fact, be hailing him. They struck his head with a reed and spat upon him and knelt down in homage to him. Indeed, they ought to be kneeling down in homage to him. 
And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak. The purple cloak, of course, represented royalty. They had placed a crown of thorns on his head. But of course, he was a king and was worthy of a crown. And they then led him away to be crucified. As Jesus is led away to be crucified, he is mocked by all. The crowd, um, his enemies. He's left utterly alone in this moment. And in that moment of loneliness, he cries out. And Mark here records what Jesus said in Aramaic. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When you see all of that mockery, one in earthly terms could hardly blame him for saying it. But it's important to understand what he's really doing here. And what he's really doing here is quoting Psalm 22. So we can't look at this passage, why have you forsaken me, without also paying some attention to what else we have in Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? I cry by day but do not answer, by night and find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved, and you they trusted and were not disappointed. And it continues in that vein and ultimately concludes with an affirmation of the fact that the Lord ultimately fulfills his promises. And that is what Jesus is uttering in that moment on the cross. The crowd was a little confused. They heard the Eloi, Eloi. He was certainly weak when he was saying it. And one of the bystanders said, hey, he's calling for Elijah. One reason I think Mark included that detail. And at this point, he dies. And at the moment of his death, pay careful attention to this next detail. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Remember that Jesus, before his passion, was predicting the destruction of the temple. The tearing of the curtain was not, of course, the ultimate destruction of the temple, but it was very, very significant. The curtain closed off the central part of the temple, called the Holy of Holies, in which the Ark of the Covenant with the Ten Commandments was kept. Only the high priest was allowed in there, and only once a year. And when he went in there, he went in there with a rope tied around his ankle. Why? Just in case God found him unworthy, they'd have a way to get his corpse out. So the curtain now was torn in two. So the Holy of Holies, the sacred place, is now open. The thing that the temple was built to house is no longer housed. It's the beginning of the end of the temple in terms of fulfilling its divine purpose. And so the tearing of the curtain at that moment is the first fulfillment of the prophecy Jesus makes about the temple. That's something important to keep in mind about prophecy in general. And we're going to talk a lot more about this in the second talk where we examine chapter 13 in some detail. But prophecies often have multiple fulfillments. They can have an immediate fulfillment and then also have longer term fulfillments. So what happens after this? There is a Gentile soldier who says, truly, this man was the Son of God. 
So we have a Gentile echoing the confession of faith made by Peter back in chapter 8, verse 29. Just as Peter's acknowledgement of the Messiah was an important moment in the gospel, so too is that of the soldier. Why? Because the soldier acknowledges the Messiahship of Jesus on behalf of the Gentile nations. Once again, this brings forward Mark's theme of the unification of the Jews and the Gentiles. So, uh, Jesus is buried. He was crucified on Friday, chapter 15, verse 42. Saturday is the Sabbath. So, 16.1, when the Sabbath was passed, the two Marys in Salome came to go and anoint him. So the resurrection is happening on Sunday, the third day, just as he predicted. Then they see a young man, an angel, sitting on the right, dressed in a robe, and he announces the resurrection. He has risen. He is not here. Go, tell his disciples and Peter. Peter is once again invited back to follow Jesus. He's not Simon anymore at this point. So what's the ultimate significance of the resurrection here? Jesus gave his life as a ransom, chapter 10, verse 45. But with the resurrection, he reclaims his ransomed life. He did have to suffer death, but death could not hold him back. Likewise, all of us who follow him will have our own moment of death. But because of Jesus breaking down the gates of death, it has no claim on us either. Jesus fulfills all of his prophecies, all three of his prophecies of his death and resurrection in this moment here early in chapter 16. He fulfills the promise of eternal life, highlighted especially in chapters 9 through 12. His blood having been poured out, the new covenant is now established and ratified. The kingdom of God now begins in earnest. Much still has to happen before Jesus returns. Chapter 13, verse 10 he states that the gospel must first be preached to all nations. He never promised a rapid return. I guess kind of a relief 20 centuries later. There's a lot more that we're going to unpack about these chapters as we continue through the evening. But for now, I invite you to reflect for a moment on the following questions. Every time we partake of the Eucharist, we are, in a sense, brought back to the moment that Jesus died when the Lamb of God was sacrificed. What might we do to best approach and appreciate the Eucharist in light of this insight? Traditional Catholic meditations on the Passion include the Sorrowful Mysteries of the Rosary, the Divine Mercy Chaplet, and the Stations of the Cross. What do you personally find to be the most compelling way for you to accompany Jesus spiritually through the Passion? How has the reality of the resurrection affected your outlook on life? In what ways might contemplating the resurrection change or affect your outlook on life? Let's take just a couple of moments to meditate on those ideas. Then in, in three minutes at 7.40, I'll begin the second talk. 